Good evening. I'm Martha Tedeschi, director of the Harvard Art Museums, and it's my special pleasure to welcome you. Tonight's program is only our second in-person program um, in Mental Hall since reopening after the long pandemic closure. As you can imagine, we're thrilled um, to have you here. And so on behalf of our entire museum team, I want to say um, how much it means to us that you are here and can join us for this important event. This evening's lecture is sponsored by the Harvard University Native American Program and the Harvard Art Museums with generous funding from a private donor. We are delighted to welcome celebrated author David Troyer as our esteemed guest for this second installment of the Harvard University Native American Program Annual Lecture. This is an ongoing series of talks intended to elevate and promote the sophistication of Native ideas, arts, literature, and culture. We are honored that HUNAP has chosen the Harvard Art Museums as a venue and partner for these impactful discussions. This lecture series acts as a catalyst across the university and certainly also here in the museums as we consider alternative ways to think, learn, and talk about Native arts in an institution with a traditional lack of Native representation in the collection and staff. I want to extend our thanks in particular to Jason Pacino and Samantha Hernandez, whose dedication has made this in-person lecture a reality following upon a most successful virtual experience last year with US Poet Laureate Joy Harjo. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Joseph Gahn, faculty director of the Harvard University Native American Program and professor of anthropology and of global health and social medicine. Please join me in warmly welcoming Joseph to the podium. Thank you, Martha, for that very warm welcome. We're delighted to be partnering with the Harvard Art Museums on this event tonight and couldn't be more excited about um, access to this beautiful venue. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome on behalf of the Harvard University Native American Program, or HUNAP. I'm honored and excited to welcome you to tonight's event entitled The Trouble with Tragedy, Imagining the Native American Past, Present, and Future. My name is Joseph Gaughan, and I am a professor of anthropology and of global health and social medicine here at Harvard. I'm a 1992 alum of Harvard College. I'm an enrolled member of the Aani Grovant Tribal Nation of Montana, and I'm the faculty director of the Harvard University Native American Program. I want to start with a brief acknowledgement of land and people. This is an acknowledgement that the Harvard University Native American Program developed collaboratively with the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. Harvard University is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. This event marks an important return to in-person campus programming for HUNAP. As we all know and experienced, the pandemic was incredibly disruptive. During the pandemic, HUNAP commemorated its 50th anniversary, which of course we had planned to do all kinds of amazing in-person events, but all those had to be converted to virtual activities, which were successful in their own right, but not exactly what we had imagined. Also during this time, HUNAP's inaugural speaker for this new annual lecture series had to shift to a virtual presentation as well. And so tonight is a second inauguration of our lecture series in which the campus community can actually gather to enjoy and benefit from this year's dynamic speaker. Not all of you may be familiar with HUNAP, so I ask your forbearance to provide the briefest of orientations to our work. HUNAP is charged with supporting the Native American and Indigenous community here at Harvard in keeping with the Harvard Charter of 1650 which commits our institution to the, quote, education of the English and Indian youth of this country, unquote. Our community is comprised today of some 260 Native American and Indigenous identified students, 
11 faculty advisors with scholarly interests and expertise in indigenous issues, and a dozen staff members both here in Hunap and elsewhere around the campus community. Beyond this, Hunap is proud to include more than 1,300 Native American and indigenous alums of Harvard University in our community as well. As an interfaculty initiative of Harvard University, our mission is fourfold, education, community, scholarship, and inclusion. And I'm very pleased to say that David Troyer's visit tonight helps to advance all four of these HUNAP commitments. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's featured speaker, Professor David Troyer. Best-selling author David Troyer is an Ojibwe Indian from Leech Lake Reservation in northern Minnesota. He is a recipient of a Pushcart Prize, two Minnesota Book Awards, and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Bush Foundation, and the Guggenheim Foundation. His book, The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, was a 2019 finalist for both the National Book Award and Carnegie Medal. He divides his time between his home on the Leech Lake Reservation and Los Angeles, where he is a professor of English at the University of Southern California. The son of Robert Troyer, an Auschwitz Jew and Holocaust survivor, and Margaret Silje Troyer, a tribal court judge, David Troyer grew up on the Leech Lake Reservation. After graduating from high school, he attended Princeton University, where he wrote two senior theses, one in anthropology and one in creative writing, and where he worked with Toni Morrison, Paul Muldoon, and Joanna Scott. Troyer graduated in 1992 and published his first novel, Little, in 1995. He received his PhD in anthropology and published his second novel, The Hiawatha, in 1999. His third novel, The Translation of Dr. Apelles, and a book of criticism, Native American Fiction, A User's Manual, appeared in 2006. The translation of Dr. Apelles was named a best book of the year by the Washington Post, Time Out, and City Pages. He published his first major work of nonfiction, Res Life, in 2012. His next novel, Prudence, was published by Riverhead Books in 2015. His essays and stories have appeared in Granta, Harper's, Esquire, Triquarterly, The Washington Post, Lucky Peach, The New York Times, The LA Times, Orion, and Slate.com. In addition to this rich description of Professor Torrey's achievements and commitments, I want to briefly add my own special appreciation for David's distinctive voice and perspectives. His experiences and contributions reflect a somewhat unlikely combination or merger of pairings. David is both Jewish and Ojibwe. He is both an Indian and an anthropologist. And he is an indigenous novelist who refuses in his creative offerings to reinforce the broad cultural preconceptions of his audience. Above all, I appreciate that David Troyer is in so many instances a myth-busting contrarian who helps to unsettle many of our taken-for-granted presumptions about Native lives and peoples. Please join me tonight in welcoming Dr. David Troyer. Thank you for having me. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for um, welcoming me so fully and so kindly um, here today. It's, it's really a thrill. Um, I remember my very first public reading was uh, for my first novel at a Borders in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Um, I was very excited to give my first reading as a fully fledged novelist and um, my roommate came with me and my mom flew in from Leech Lake to accompany me on my maiden voyage as a public speaker and reader. And we got to the bookstore in Bloomfield Hills and um, there was a great big stack of books, my first novel, Little, and a bunch of chairs and uh, no people. <laughs> there were no people there. And the manager of the bookstore started to get really anxious that nobody was showing up and um, she, she felt bad, obviously. And so some guy was walking through and it's actually, that's not entirely true. This guy was staggering through the bookstore. <laughs> and, uh, and he looks at, and he had, <laughs> in that way that people who are very drunk do, you know, who think, they just look this way and it, it, things look better, <laughs> you know? And he's like, looking at the stack of 
books. <laughs> the hell's going on? And uh, the woman said, well, there's a reading. This is the author, David Troyer. Those are his books. You know, you should listen. You should come. You should listen to his reading. <laughs> and he looks at his watch, you know, bringing it in and out of focus. And he's like, well, the old lady won't pick me up for 15 minutes. I guess I can stick around. And then he passes out in the front row. <laughs> and uh, it's both good and bad, right? Because it's bad because you want this. It's good because there's nowhere but up. And uh, so I don't know how he's doing. I, I should have I kept in touch with him. When I anticipated um, the opportunity of spending time with you and sharing some words with you, I, I had a temp there was a temptation that I, was almost overwhelming, and I say almost because I wasn't overwhelmed. Um, the temptation was, since I'm at Harvard, to give a very formal, very witty, sort of hot take on something, you know. Um, the urge was significant, but I had to there was an internal reckoning that happened, and I had to reckon with the fact that I, I don't do hot takes, uh, I'm not witty, and i um, not formal. And so I thought, okay, well then I'll, I'll read something, but then I, I don't like doing that, because, and this is an assumption, um, you can read. <laughs> so instead, and you'll have to beg my pardon, I want to tell you a story um, in two parts. So. I want to tell, I want to share the story with you of how I swerved into nonfiction at all. And in so doing, um, we'll address this beautiful title that I somehow came up with, um, which you know, will be included in the story that I tell you, I hope. Um, so I, I should start by saying that I was very content for most of my career only writing fiction. And in that, only writing novels. I've published maybe, I think, one short story that is in fact a short story and not a part of something longer in my life. I was, I was very happy with this. Um, you know, when JFK was asked why he wanted to be president, he said, because that's where the power is. And I felt very naively and very narrowly that that's, that was true of novels. That's where the power is. Um, that's where I wanted to work. That's where I wanted to say something. And I was content. Because honestly, between you and me, it's the best job in the world. You sit in a room by yourself and you make things up. You lie professionally. Um, and you lie at length. And it's, if you don't do it already, let me tell you, it's gratifying work. Um, it's thrilling work. And I had no ambition to, to move beyond that. I truly didn't. Um, but a couple things happened. One thing happened, and then another thing happened. So the first thing that happened was that there was a school shooting at Red Lake Reservation in 2005. So those of you who don't know, Red Lake is just up the road from Leech Lake, where I'm from. Um, it's a sister reservation of sorts. We're very tied to one another through family, through ceremony. Um, and to have something like that happen at a place like Red Lake was, was very tough. I was in New York when I got the news from my older brother who called me and after he, he told me that there had been a shooting, um, I sat, you know, I, I turned on the television at my friend's apartment and I was trying to figure out what happened. And um, what had happened is that a kid from Red Lake named Jeffrey Weiss had killed his grandfather who was a tribal policeman with his own service weapon and then stole his weapons, his Kevlar vest, his squad car, drove to the high school and opened fire on his classmates, his teachers, and uh, the staff. By the time that, that Jeff Reed Weiss was done, 10 people were dead, including, including Weiss. In what was then, in 2005, the, worst school, the second worst school shooting in US history, the first being Columbine. And uh, I didn't know any of that then. I was trying to figure out what happened and I turned on the television. And I was getting really upset. Uh, the more I changed from channel to channel, from station to station, I was getting, I was, it was a moment of crisis for me. And I kept turning this, the, the channels. And then in the days that followed, or that day I kept, I went from new source to new source online, and then in print media in the days that followed. 
and all of it contributed to m making me more upset, more um, very, very angry. And I was so angry that day that my friend who I was staying with was alarmed and, and he said, I, okay, I know why you're upset that this happened, but why are you upset at my television? And I don't know if I had the ability to articulate what I was feeling then. I don't remember, it's a little hazy. But what I was feeling was that I wasn't getting the news. On every single channel that I turned to that day, and every site I visited subsequently, and every paper I bought in the days that followed, it was more or less the same headline. On a poor remote reservation, tragedy strikes. And so I, was, I would explain to anyone who would, would listen in the days that followed, I'm like, that's not the news. That's not what happened, to whom, why, what's happening next, who's hurt, where did they get taken? But, you know, the basic information, I want an information on this place that I loved, on these people that I loved. I used to work in that high school. I dropped out of graduate school, I worked there. My dad had been a teacher in that high school. My mom had worked for that school. You know? I wanted information, but all I was getting was the same old sad story. And that's it. And uh, I would tell people, I'm like, look, when Columbine happened, you know, they did not say, on a largely Anglo, fairly affluent exurb. They didn't. They didn't feel compelled to mention class. They didn't feel compelled to mention race. And they only mentioned geography insofar as to locate Columbine High School in Jefferson County, and that's it. You know? But with Red Lake, I said it was just storytelling and bad storytelling at that. So in the days that followed, I was actually in New York to try and hawk my wares and try to get in, in a, in a publisher interested in my fiction, which was increasingly hard to do because I was so difficult. Um, <laughs> such a pain in the butt. And uh, um, so I was talking with the editor and the owner of Grove Press, and I was spinning out my complaints to him about this. And he said, well, you know, we've always wanted to publish a book about reservations and what they mean and where they're going. And, and um, why they exist, and you know, what native writers write nonfiction. And this is my chance to give you career advice, all of you. Um, and that advice is to lie. Because um, I said, sadly, Morgan, um, I'm the only native writer that writes nonfiction. <laughs> I had written no nonfiction, none. And he said, well, you know, if it, would you write this book for us? And I'm like, well, if I'm called to the work, I'm called to the work. <laughs> and so, so, so I had a book contract all of a sudden to write a nonfiction book. And I was so naive that I thought writing nonfiction was going to be easy compared to writing fiction. I thought, non, you know, nonfiction, you go out there, you talk to people, you find out the things that happen, you write down the things that happened, and you're done. And no, I really, I really was like that. Um... And so there I was, and there I went, and, and there I tried to write what was to become Res Life. And um, I, I didn't know how, honestly. All I knew was the kind of story I did not want to tell. I didn't want to tell the same old sad story about reservation life, because what I'd said to Morgan and what I said to anyone who would listen, I'm like, you know, this is not the story of reservations. These aren't miserable places where hope goes to die. These are important, vital, complicated places that are precious to us. And, you know, and it was strange how often I had to sort of say things like that. I'm like, we, I don't love Leech Lake where I'm from because it sucks, you know? Come for the trauma, stay for the alcoholism. Like, I, that's not why I love my home. There are real reasons, there are good reasons why I'm invested in, and we, many of us are invested in our reservation communities that escape the notice of most people and sometimes even escape our notice. And the problem is that um, reservations, uh, native life generally, right, is understood as necessarily tragic. 
You know, the story of the Indian in this country is a descending line. You know, native people are peoples with a great future behind us. That's, that's the common assumption, and it's an assumption that we ourselves share oftentimes, too often, you know? Um, there's an over-reliance on a tragic telling. You know? And going back to our Aristotle, which I'm, all, I'm sure all of you have to hand today with you. You brought it, right? Good. Um, tragedy is a drama posed in such a form, I'm paraphrasing, posed in such a form as to elicit the twin feelings of pity and fear, which result in a catharsis, you know, an emotional release unburdening. This is why we watch Hamlet. This is why we watch Macbeth. This is why we pay attention to the, to the Kardashians. <laughs> you know. um, and you know, that kind of narrative shape you know, produces a limited set of reactions. You know? People can engage with us and with the story of our lives as a kind of way to feel something intensely about us and then to f feel like cathartically unburdened of those emotions and to mistake that unburdening with change. And I find that ultimately dissatisfying and not commensurate with our lives in any way. So I knew I didn't want to tell the same old sad story. I knew that the tragic narrative that narrative shape would not work, and that, in fact, that narrative itself was part of the problem. But I didn't know what. What's the alternative? What's the counter-narrative? Um, that was in no way clear to me at all. So I wrote a draft of the book anyway, and I gave it to my publisher, and then he was very quiet um, for a long time. Bitter professional advice, when your editor is very quiet for a long time, it's never good. <laughs> And uh, he finally got back to me and he said, so, you know, I've read it. I said, fantastic. He said, everyone in house has read it. I said, that's great. We're all of the same mind, he said. I'm like, that's beautiful. Consensus is really the only way forward. And he said, yeah, so, um, okay, the consensus is that you need to start over. I said, oh, like, oh, oh, so like there's some parts that should be amplified and there's some parts that maybe need to be reduced or cut and he said, yeah, if you were listening, you would have not heard me say that. What I said was, we're not going to publish this, and if you give us this book again, we're going to cancel your contract, and we want our advance back. And I'm like, what advance? You know, it's so gone. Right? <laughs> Where do they think, do they think I'm holding on to it? You know? And... Uh, but it was, you know, but he was not wrong. He was not wrong because it's not enough, right, to know what you don't want to do. You do have to know what you do want to do and how you want to do it. And I was lost. But then, life being life, you know, an opportunity presented itself for me to discover that, but it was not a, a happy thing. And what happened was, um, in the next year, after I got my manuscript back, um, and it's strange, because I don't remember what year this actually happened. Um, and I think trauma is a bit like that. You know? It sort of, it messes with many things, and it, it messes with time among them. But what happened was my grandfather committed suicide by shooting himself in the head, in his bedroom, in the village of Leech Lake, where I'm from. I was in Minneapolis at the time. I drove north. I got to the village in the evening. Everybody was there. Um, I went to my grandmother's trailer. So my grandmother and my grandfather split up. That's not the tragedy. So they, they split up because, like, the story goes that my grandmother wanted to change the curtains in their house. And my grandfather said, well, no, Ma put those up. His mother, my great-grandmother. Well, Ma put those up, so they got to stay. Or she gotta, she's got to take them down. My grandfather was a very stubborn man. And my grandmother said, she's dead. And he goes, I guess they're fucking staying up then. <laughs> and so, so she's like, that's it, Jean. And she moved out. But where I'm from, I don't know how it is for you all, but where I'm from, 
there's no point in being mad at anybody unless they can see you being mad at them all the time. You have to be in their sight line. You know? If you stay mad, you don't have to get mad. This is sort of a, this is, you know, if you want native knowledge, this is it. You know, if you wanted some cultural wisdom, there you go. So my grandmother's like, that's it. And she put a trailer like on the edge of his yard. <laughs> so she could be mad there, right? Anyway, so I went to her trailer. Um, she was on the couch. She's the one that found him in his house. And uh, she asked me to do two things. She asked me to write a eulogy for his service. And I said, okay, I'm a writer, right? How hard could that be? And uh, there I go again being naive, right? And uh, she goes, I want you to go up to the big house and clean up what he did. You know, like I don't want anyone to know what happened. So, and she couldn't use the word blood, but she said, you know, if there's anything that's messed up, it's got, it's got to go. And, you know, just take it out of there. And she's like, you know, your uncles can't see that. And I didn't really have the wherewithal to stick up for myself, you know, because, but I was thinking to myself, well, what makes you think I can, what makes you think I can look at that? But she didn't think I was very close with him, you know? I was, but I said yes. I did not know how to say no to her. So I went up there to his, his house and I spent the day very literally, you know, cleaning his brains and blood off the floor of his bedroom all day. And then removing the carpet, removing any, the bed, removing everything from the room, ev down to the subfloor. And she wanted it all burned, and in that I did not humor her. I just dumped it behind the um, furnace in the yard, because we have these wooden furnaces outside that pump heat inside. I just dumped it back behind there. And I went home and I had to write his eulogy, which I'd never done before. And so like, I was trying to think of what I wanted to say about him, you know, or what I needed to say. I'm a very functional approach kind of person. What is the function of this piece of writing? What's its purpose? If I know its purpose, I can figure out its structure and its sense. That's just how I approach writing generally. I said, so what's the purpose of a eulogy? What, what job does it need to do? And so I had to think about this. And I had to think about this while I was sort of consumed with th this sort of the image of the contents of my grandfather's head. Right. And so I'm like, okay, well, a eulogy has to say something true of the deceased. That's one function. That feels accurate. Because there's nothing worse, you know, and a lot of us have been there, right? You've been there. You've been to these funerals where someone's being eulogized by somebody who doesn't know them well, you know? You know, in terms that have no bearing on their actual life or personality. Like, Uncle Joe was so sweet. He loved kids and dogs, and you're like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Uncle Joe was a first-class asshole. <laughs> but we loved him. But you can't say these things. These things aren't true, so you have to say something true. That's important. And the other thing you have to do is you have to say something of some use to the living, because ultimately that's really who it's for. The dead, they don't need it. They don't, they're gone, depending on what you believe, off doing whatever they're doing. So, OK. I had to think, what's true of my grandfather? But I, I have to tell you, like, every part of me wanted catharsis. That's what I wanted. I wanted an emotional unburdening. I wanted relief from my anger and my disappointment, my confusion. You know, I was vastly disappointed. I was incredibly angry at him. And um, I wanted catharsis, you know? But I'm like, okay, well, what's true then? Really, what's true of his life? He shot himself in the head, that's true, you know? The bullet was in his head for a fraction of a second, that's true. Prior to that, he lived for 83 years, that's also true, you know? So what's, what has more weight? 83 years or a split second? Well, what's true of him was that he lived 83 years. That's more true. It has more weight. It has more substance than this final act, which was committed for reasons I still don't understand. 
and don't really need to. Um, okay, so 83 years. What were those 83 years like? You know, it was so tempting to, to, to narrate his life as a life of hardship, as a life of loss, as a tragic life lived, and at that barely. But is that true? Like, I, don't, I don't think so. He lived 80 of his 83 years in the village of Bina, Minnesota, population 140. It was the only place on earth that mattered to him, and I mean that. I'm not exaggerating. Cass Lake to the west, Grand Rapids, Deer River to the east, even Federal Dam, eight miles to the south. He could not have cared less about those places. You know, that village, that's it. That was his horizon. And he got to live 80 of his 83 years there, and that's not tragic. That's good fortune. I'm not that fortunate. I'm 51, and I've not got to spend the majority of my life in the place that matters to me the most. He's fortunate. You know, not unlucky. And he got to spend 80 of his 83 years in a place where he got to see the only people that mattered to him every single day of his life, except for the three years that he was in first France, then Belgium, then Germany, killing German people. 80 years, every day. His parents, his siblings, his cousins, his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Not a day went by that he did not see them. It's not an exaggeration. That's not tragic. That's, a, that's, not, that's good fortune. It's a life of plenty, really. And yes, he suffered. Yes, he lost. You know, he buried his kids. He buried my cousin, his granddaughter. You know, he lost. He did suffer. But that's not all he did. And so as I was trying to think about what was true of him and of what was some use to those of us who had to carry on, this seemed more profoundly true than whatever tragedy I wanted to mobilize to make myself feel better. And as I was thinking about that, I started thinking about the book that I had failed to write. I'm like, okay, so my grandfather's life wasn't a life of, of lack, a life of deficit. It was a life of surplus. It was, a, it was extra, his life, you know? And what if, what if, I'm, I'm very suspicious of epiphanies. I'm very anti-epiphany. Um, but I had an epiphany. Yeah. I'm like, what if, and this is true of my grandfather, but what if by extension this, is, this could be true of reservation life? What if we could see these places, not as places where there's less of everything, but, but more of everything? More poverty, but more hustle, you know? More crime, <laughs> but more law. I mean, we have extra constitutions, you know? <laughs> If you need one, <laughs> we got you. More pain, arguably, more humor. You know, so what if, that's, that's the opposite of tragedy, right, for me. That was my counter narrative. That was the narrative I've been missing when I first go around with this book. If I could see, if I, that was my narrative. Reservations where there's, it's extra. There's more of everything. More hardship, more humor, all these things. You know, that was my way out, you know. And so, I wrote the eulogy. I we buried my grandfather. I rewrote the book and it was actually published. Um, and I thought, I'm done, honestly, done with nonfiction. It's actually too hard. Turns out, turns out that it's harder than fiction. <laughs> Nobody told me this. You know. Fiction, you get to, it's a puzzle that you create and solve. Nonfiction, you're inheriting the sh shapes of things and you have to find your way through them. It's just much more difficult. And you have to go on the road and you have to talk to people, which, Appearances to the contrary is not always easy for me. Um, anyway, so writing the nonfiction was hard, but I was done. I'm like, I'm done. This is it. Done it. I'm good. We're fine now. 
But then it seemed to me like, well, there's more to be said, right? I mean, and there's more to be said because, you know, as I go out and about doing things like this, in fact, you know, I would get really frustrated with people because, you know, people come, people, you know, at you with all these ideas about what being Native is, you know? And I just feel like, I, I felt for years where I just want, I wanted like a pocket edition of truth, I guess. Like just, you know, just read this. I mean, just don't, and don't bother me, you know? Um, and, cause you can have, you can't have reservations without native folk, but you have plenty of native folk without reservations, you know? And there is this overriding assumption, you know, as I traveled out and about and talked to people that sort of was coming to me, you know, came at me all the time. And my fellow native folk in this room, you know, you know this as well as I do, um, that there's, there are many assumptions about us because we're in this peculiar place, right? In the American imagination. On one hand, we are almost no part of most Americans' lived experience. And that is in part designed, it's designed that way. We are, we are unseen all the time, right? This is, this is not accidental. And I'll talk about population in a, a little bit later, but because um, population suggests that this shouldn't be the case. Um, but we're, we're really not a part of, of most Americans' lived experience, but we occupy vast amounts of American headspace, and we are fundamental to the stories this country tells itself about itself. It's a weird position to be the most visible, invisible segment part of the Republic. Um, and so most people think that Native life effectively ended when the frontier ended, when the frontier was closed in 1890. According to the US Census, the West was settled that year, you know, the year of, of the uh, massacre at Wounded Knee Creek, which has come to stand in symbolically for the, the end of Native life as we know it. If people can admit that we somehow are in fact alive, it's not really life we're living. We just exist in a state of constant suffering. And our history is only a laundry list of abuse that killed most of us and that some of us have managed to endure. That's the assumption. You know, so much so that when I was the age of many of you, when I was a student uh, as an undergraduate in 1990, and someone, I'm not sure why I read this, but I read um, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by Dee Brown, which was and remains, um, and you can do your part to end this, um, remains the best selling book of Native American history ever published. Published in 1970, great year. Um, year of my birth. <laughs> um, millions of copies in print. It's never been out of print. It's, it's translated into 17 languages. And on the very first page of that, so I read that as a sophomore. And on the very first page, he says something to the effect of, this book is about the American West, a time of unparalleled greed and violence, you know, and cries for freedom made by those who had it at the expense of those who don't. He was a good writer, D. Brown. Um, I started at the beginning of the Plains Wars in the 1850s, and I end at the massacre at Wounded Knee Creek in 1890, where, and now I'm going to quote a little more directly, where the culture and civilization of the American Indian was destroyed. And I remember thinking, little me from Leech Lake, far from home, really lonely, really homesick. I remember thinking, bullshit. And then on the next page, he says, so if you happen to travel to a contemporary Indian reservation and notice the poverty and the hopelessness and the squalor, perhaps by reading my book, you will begin to understand why. It's all right there. You know. This is the common assumption. So I thought, okay, you know, our history surely is more than what we've simply managed to survive or that killed most of us. We've been up to surely much more than simply suffering over the past 130 years two years. You know. So I thought, okay, 1890, I'll just write a follow-up and counter-narrative to D. Brown. I will start in 1890, 
and I'll bring the story of Native American life up to the present with the opposite thesis, which is that 1890 was certainly a low point, if not the lowest, in my estimation, since first contact. 1890, we saw our political institutions at their most compromised and the most shambolistic, which is not a word, but you get it. Um, with the passage of the Dawes Act three years prior, our land was disappearing from beneath our feet at a rapid pace. Ultimately, we lost 90 million acres to that process. At the same time, with the start of the boarding school era, our children were being disappeared from our homes and often, but not always, sent to uh, residential boarding schools far from home. Our families were in crisis. Our land was in crisis. Our political and religious institutions were in crisis. And our religions were, in fact, banned, which maybe you guys don't know. But do you know what year they were officially unbanned? Anyone? 78. Yeah. The Indian Religious Freedom Act, right? 78? I love Jimmy Carter. You know. Nixon was also a very good president for Native people. And people don't like to hear that, but it's true. You know? His football coach was native. He loved, it was kind of fun to watch Nixon, at least in the historical record, like agonize when AIM took over, like, you know, and like he did want to help so badly, but they made it so hard, you know? And then he was in agony until he finally just couldn't take it anymore, whatever. But anyway, um, 1890 was a low point from which we have been emerging. So that was the story I wanted to tell. So to tell that story, I had to, go into the historical record, I had to go out and talk to people. And I had to take a little inward turn, because this was my quest, after all, to find some way to see what we've been doing as Native people differently. I was emotionally invested in this, in, in, in coming to answers. I didn't know what we've been doing. You know? And it's, it's funny, though, right? So, so then that was the book, that was the plan. And that was sort of another attempt to sort of slide out from under, to posit and to explore some other counter-narrative, right? A narrative that is not a tragic narrative. And that's really, see, there, there's a problem. You know, my, my colleague, Viet Nguyen at USC, um, who recently won the Pulitzer Prize for The Sympathizer, it's a great book, you should read it. But he said um, in a talk he gave re recently, about Asian American literature and film. He said, you know, we, as Asian American people, we suffer from narrative scarcity. There are a lot of, of Asian American folk who are writing novels and writing nonfiction, um, who are making movies, who are acting in movies, who are producing, directing, all these things. There are a lot of Asian people in film and in books and making both, he said, but we don't have a lot of different kinds of narratives. There are very few different kinds of stories about Asian American life being told, which is why he actually really loved Crazy Rich Asians, but not because it was good. It wasn't good by most measures, but it was a kind of story that we don't see very often or see before. And for that, you know, and that was sort of, that was the point that he was, he was talking about that movie in particular. So, but, and we are in a similar position. As Native people, we suffer from narrative scarcity. You know? And I am a zealot, I think, in that I do believe very strongly um, that words shape the world. I believe very strongly, and this is, could be the Ojibwe part of me, it could be the anthropological part of me, it could be both. And it could also be not important to really nail that down to um, you know, cleanly and firmly. Um, the kinds of stories we tell, the kinds of stories that we think of as logical, as reasonable, as convincing, will shape, you know, our own self-regard, you know, and the regard that people have of us, that other people have of us. Words shape all, shape, you know, narrative shapes the world. So our over-reliance on this sort of tragic mode, you know, it's just not sort of like, you know, this is not a call to smurf everything up. <laughs> you know? Like, we don't have to sing all the damn time. You know, the opposite of tragedy is not hope. I hope you, I hope you don't 
get that from this talk. That's just the, it's another flimsy kind of narrative. It's the other side of the tragic coin. You know, as Oscar Wilde said, that's a currency that we get paid in, like very small change, you know. I'm not into it. It's not sufficient. It doesn't change anything. So um, that's sort of, it feels very important to address this sort of narrative scarcity that affects Native people. I think even more fundamentally than my colleague um, suggests that, you know, affects Asian American people. Um, we get like one kind of story told about us and told by us quite often. You know? It feels really important to move beyond that. Um, and there's this tendency people have, right? There's this tendency um, of people to tune into Native lives as a kind of liberal social act, you know, like volunteering on an after school program to teach kids how to read. Like, oh, you know, it's really terrible what happened to Native people. The least I could do is read this book by Troyer <laughs> or Deloria. Yeah. That's, that's why most people pick up books about Native things. Let's be honest. There's better reasons, though, to do that. You know? There are better reasons to, to sort of tune into Native stories than simply to sort of, you know, alleviate when you know, one's guilt by having a little cathartic moment. You know, so in researching this book, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rant for just a couple minutes and then we're gonna open it up for Q&A, right? It'll be fun. Um, so just a couple minute rant and then I'll be done. Um, but um, in the writing of The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, I discovered many things. I mean, neither that book nor Res Life were written from the position of a guy who knows things. Both books were written from the position of a person who really wanted to learn something, wanted to see things differently. You know? And so the discoveries I made, you know, which were new to me um, when I was writing Heartbeat, you know, really, really, really helped me feel even more confident um, that there are better reasons to tune into Native stories than as a liberal social act. I don't think you can understand this country without knowing Native history. It's that simple. You can't take this country's temperature. You can't know where it's been. You certainly can't know where it's going unless you know Native history. It is really that simple. You know, so we're in Boston, greater metropolitan area, right? So America's First Revolutionary Act was a dump tea in Boston Harbor. You all know that, of course. But you, you also know that they dressed as Mohawk Indians to dump tea in Boston Harbor. Most people don't know that. But you're smart people, you know? I know when someone's laughing, well, you're not? You know? It's true, though. Um, and one of, the reasons, one of the reasons why they dressed as Mohawk folks was one of the reasons why the colonists went to war against the British was over the question of who got to profit off of westward expansion. Who got to profit by taking our shit? The colonists or the crown? Not the only reason, but that was the main reason. The big reason, you know? Um, our country's first treaty signed before this country became a country was the Treaty of Fort Pitt, which enlisted Delaware support of you know, the revolutionaries to guard the sort of western doors so the British couldn't do an end around. You know? After the revolution, when the founding fathers, so-called, were looking around for a form of government never before seen on earth, again, in part, to whom did they turn? To the Mohawk, to the Iroquois Confederacy, again. And it's at least in part on them that our separation of powers is based, between the executive and the judicial and the legislative. I'm always afraid that I won't be able to remember all three, just like Trump couldn't remember all three, you know? I'm like, it, it, and it's, the, you know. The first test of states' rights versus federal power was not over the issue of slavery, which is what we're taught most often. It was over the question of Indian removal. The passage of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Power in this country has always been three-way, states, feds, in sovereign native nations, always. The first test wasn't slavery. 
The first test was removal. You know, even more recently, between 1965 and 1995, the United States Supreme Court heard more cases about federal Indian law than any other genre of law, more than banking, more than immigration, more than civil rights, more than reproductive rights, women's rights. As America was trying to rethink itself during and in the wake of the Vietnam War, civil rights, Pentagon Papers, Watergate, at least at that level, America was trying to rethink itself by contemplating the question of the collective rights of sovereign nations. America hasn't just been obsessed by us, and it certainly has been obsessed about us for a long time. It is, it is, it is made in our image, this country, founded by us, shaped, you know, our government has a native shape in part, you know? Power in this country is native inflected. It has always been so. You know. And even more recently, you know, with the Dakota Access Pipeline protests a few years ago, referred to by the former chairman of Standing Rock, David Archambault III, and I respectfully disagree with this characterization, as another case of cowboys versus Indians, and I disagree with him respectfully. That's not what we saw in North Dakota. What we saw in North Dakota was a struggle between the common good and corporate greed, and it was Native people who were taking that fight on behalf of all modern <laughs> people. So this country, you know, its story isn't that it has a Native past in an American present and future, you know. The story of this country is not simply that it once had Indians, that it treated poorly, you know. The story of this country is much more complicated than that. And the place of Native people in it is much more complicated than that. At the same time that I read, and I'll finish very quickly here, but at the same time that I read Bury My Heart at Udini, I read another book, not quite so good, less frustrating, as frustrating because it was boring. Um, <laughs> The 18th Premier of Louis Bonaparte, anyone? Marx? So good. It's not good. Um, but he says something really great on the first page. So for those of you who only want to skim, let's read the first page. Put it on your shelf. You know, college is for building a library. And uh, he says something to the effect of, and it's going to be a bad paraphrase, that all men make history. They don't always make it with tools of their choosing. Um, they don't always make it as they wish, but they make it nonetheless. And that stuck in my head the same time that I read um, Bury My Heart in 1990. And I thought, yes, OK. You know, that's how to see what Native people have been up to for the past 130 years since we were all supposed to have you know, died, according to Brown and all the others. We've been making history, not always with tools of our choosing, certainly not positions of privilege or power very often but we've been making it nonetheless. And that to me was sort of, you know, the counter narrative. I think I'll conclude, but thank you so much for your time. And we're gonna have a conversation now. So you're ready, right? Thank you. I got a, a note, a note from someone that you're not supposed to stand up because you're going to block the camera, and they want to make sure the camera is, is on me like all the like all all the time. My very first week of while you're thinking of questions, my very first week of graduate school at the University of Michigan, um, I was I was there was a big reading by by Carlos Fuentes there at Rackham. It was the big lecture hall. It was huge. It was packed. And a couple thousand people. Everyone was very excited. So I show up. You know, I'm new to my department. I'm just a, a first year graduate student. No one knows me yet, you know. And Fuentes was talking about his book, The Buried Mirror, which was kind of a, kind of a book about multiculturalism, which was a very hot and angry topic, strangely enough, at that time. And um, less, less sort of anxiety inducing now, I think. And uh, 
he said something to the effect of, in, in his, and he was such a good speaker. He had so much power in his voice, so much presence. Um, and he's up on that stage, and all these people are watching him. You know? And he said, you know, we're all travelers here. From you know, the first Indian who crossed the land bridge 20,000 years ago to the last migrant who swam the river last night. And I'm thinking to myself, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. <laughs> Uh uh-uh. uh. And so I got up and, and I made my way to the microphone and I said, This was my mistake. So I'm here, I'm going to give you some better words. But my mistake was to say, I don't have a question, I have a statement. <laughs> now, if I'd been wiser and savvier, I would have done the thing that you're supposed to do, which is, Don't you think? And then you make a statement. <laughs> you know? Um, but I said, I spoke in Ojibwe for a while, um, and I said, and then I translated, or I actually pretended to translate, you know. I just said a bunch of garbage, you know, and then, and then pretended to translate. I'm like, you know, we're not all just travelers here, you know. And, you know, our languages, you know, aren't gone, and we're not gone, and, you know. And then I got a standing ovation, you know. For like publicly shaming Carlos Fuentes, like a whole lecture hall like erupts and starts clapping, you know. And I'm like, I'm dead. My whole department is there, right? I'm like, I'm dead, you know. <laughs> this is their first impression. They're like, great, we have to work with that guy, you know. But they were gracious. They worked with me anyway. So yeah, it's time for you to say, don't you think that? <laughs> Go for it. Or make a statement. We're all friends here. It can be about the Kardashians, even, if you'd like. Right? I don't know much about them, but I'll pretend like I'm, you know, I do. I didn't scare you. you know? That's not possible. Yes, there's a question. I love it. My question was, do you think the story is different north of the border? Absolutely. It's got to be. There are going to be similarities in Canada, of course. And there's other people who could speak to this much more nimbly than I could who are here. But it is going to be different in some ways. The, you know, the timing of when Canada was confederated is different. How long it existed sort of as sort of principally commonwealth and before sort of actual nationhood is different. All of this is how it was colonized. It's all different to a degree. There will be some similarities, but um, I didn't, like, I kind of, I toyed with the question for myself, like, am I going to talk about North America or just the United States? I didn't feel qualified. I didn't feel like I, I could, could possibly know enough to talk about Canada. And quite honestly, I didn't discuss Alaska or Hawaii either. Um, I, I don't feel qualified to do that. Because um, those are just very different. Um, and different in ways I'm sure would elude like anything that I would try to see, you know. So, so not only yes, would it be different across the border um, and across the northern border and the southern one, you know. Um, you know, there's only so much I, I can handle, honestly. But yeah, absolutely. That's a really good question. Someone should do that. You know, not me though. I'm never writing nonfiction again. <laughs> yes. Um, I know there has been Wait, there's a microphone coming your way. Uh, I know there's been movement with the Lakota to um, get enough native speakers who are still native speaking oh, yeah. to, um, to keep the language alive for younger students. Mm -hmm. are, have you, is that apparently not a problem with the Ojibwe? Oh, no, and it's a problem for all tribes. Is it? That's what I was Absolutely. wondering. If there's any movement to, um, to uh, anyone seeing, to do an overview to kind of help. Um, yeah, I, I was always imagined kind of a, uh, a center somewhere in the US I where every that. tribe would have its place and um, that the languages could be maintained. And yeah. do you know anyone who's doing that? There are a lot of people doing that. Not building some sort of national clearinghouse, right? Or maybe even a national um, archive. 
of native languages. There's not too many native languages. Um, not too many, never enough. But, um, but various tribes, you know, language revitalization is probably the most significant thing happening on the ground in so many communities. You know, in the Southwest, um, in Ojibwe country, and in fact, I dropped out of graduate school for a while. I was kind of sick of it. Dropped out and I moved home to work on Ojibwe language revitalization and tried to start an immersion school. Um, worked for a nonprofit that was trying to, to start immersion schools at White Earth Reservation and Leech Lake Reservation. It was very frustrating just because of the nonprofit that I happened to be working for, but um, it was pretty dysfunctional. But that effort continued. And there's an Ojibwe language immersion school at Leech Lake called Nigane. There's one in Wisconsin called Waduka Dotting. And my older brother, in fact, Anton, um, that's his life work. That's what he does. Um, a lot of people are doing that. And it's, it's vital. It's really important. You know. As Anton says, I mean, he's like, he's a very good speaker. He's better at this than I am. But um, he says, yeah, you know, the government spent you know, hundreds of years trying to take our stuff away and put us in the ground, so why would we look to them to, to fix it? Well, we have to do that. We have to, you know, so the, there's a very sort of, there's an, you know, activism in the 60s was, and 70s was very outward facing. You know, we were all trying to talk to the man. Activism is, there's still that, and the pipeline protest and sort of prevention is very much that. Um, but there's been a lot of activism in the 80s and 90s and aughts, which is facing inward, you know, around language and culture revitalization. Um, it's very important work. It's not very visible, um, but it's really important work. And there's a lot of it happening all over the place. That's a really good question. Right, with the dog, I'm sorry, you gotta ask the dog's gotta, yeah, we need that. Right, gotta wait for the mic. It's a really cute dog. Tēnā koe, tēnā te tuata hiwa ku mihi ka mihi kātika ki a koe mō o mō maramatanga mō manaaki ki tō kaupapa nei. So, ahakoa no Aotearoa ahau ka marama au ki tau e kōrero nei. So, just to first acknowledge who you are as an Ojibwe person, uh, and that so much of what you said resonates with you know, what we have back home in Aotearoa, New Zealand, mm. um, particularly around the perhaps crises of representation that occur within, indigenous co within the indigenous cosmos. And you spoke about that scarcity of, of narratives and the interventions, I suppose, to try and negotiate that away. Um, and I fear sometimes, even at home within Māori literature, we reproduce you know, unwittingly those power relations that continue to subjugate who and what Māori are. Mm. And I, I kind of wonder, you, you spoke earlier today um, when, we were, when we had lunch about, you know, ways of upending those narratives to create um, or to push back against those dominant ways of understanding who and what um, we are as Indigenous people. So I wondered if you could speak a little bit to that and how that, um, you know, tries to push back or break against that, that scarcity of narratives. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, tēnei te tino mihi atu ki aku, ki auka, thank you. Could I have you like rephrase the, the question part? <laughs> like, um, and simplify it for me, because I, I have trouble sometimes. So like what, um, so when we, how I push back against scarcity? That, that scarcity of narrative, I suppose. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and how that's done and how you uh, do that, because at, at home in Aotearoa, we right. have a lot of, unfortunately, I think the reproduction of stereotype Unwittingly so, but unfortunately, even you know, by Māori authors and even within film, unfortunately, reproducing those stereotypes. So keen to hear how you go about challenging and, and pushing back against that. I, I, for me, it's I'm just such a I'm such a natural contrarian. Um, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but you know, I was a very insecure kid, you know, <laughs> and. Uh, and college, a high school student, college student, you know? And so the only thing I ever knew how to do was to attack, you know, as a, as a sort of, as a sort of, that's how I dealt with my insecurity. You know, so I was always, I'm, I'm very oppositional in that, you know, and defiant right, in that regard, to bar some psychological terms. Um, 
And, um, you know, so, so for me, like, it's, it's always a matter of, like, just pushing and pushing against the grain and just, just sort of, you know, what ifing all the time, you know? Um, and so, for instance, I just wrote this piece um, for Atlantic Monthly where I was asked by the Atlantic Monthly to write a piece about national parks and Native American people. And I said, I'm not going to write the same old crap. I told this to the editor. He's like, that's why we're asking you. We don't want the same old crap. I'm like, I'm not going to write a piece about how we're connected to nature. I'm not going to write that. You know? He said, like, that we don't want you to. That's why we asked you to do it and not somebody else. And I'm like, well, what should I talk about? He says, well, go big. And I'm like, all the national parks should be returned to native control. Not because we love nature, but because administratively, I think we'd be very good at protecting our parks and better than the Park Service. You know? We have now a couple, or a hundred plus years experience in dealing with wider, widely scattered parcels which can't exactly be monetized and taxed. You know, in we administering to sort of far-flung lands and populations. Like, we can do this. We already do this, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, you know, so that was the argument I made, but it was sort of very sort of administrative kind of argument. Like we as, as tribal nations have been doing this kind of thing for a long time. And the Park Service has been doing a bad job. And, um, and, and in addition, you know, the nation's soul, I think, would be soothed to some extent by reparations. You know? It would um, it'd be possible for America to think um, kindly about itself again. You know? Um, for their sake, not for our sake, for their sake. They should give us back pretty much 87 million acres, only slightly less than what was taken with the passage of the Dawes Act. So it's equal. Even Stephen. You know? And we, you know, we'll keep taking care of it and we won't kick all the white people out. You know? We're good neighbors. So, anyway. Yeah, so I made that argument and people, so I'm like, he's like, that's great. Let's do that. I'm like, okay. You know? Um, so, I, so in answer to your question, I'm just kind of wired in a way to, to kind of cause trouble. There's this quote by Pes Pascal, which I really like. He says something to the effect of, this is a bad paraphrase. Um, he says, if he humbles himself, I praise him. If he praises himself, I humble him and contradict him always until he comprehends that he's an incomprehensible monster. <laughs> and I'm like, that's a tattoo waiting to happen, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but those are good words to live by. Those are words that work for me, you know? So, and someone here probably knows Pascal way better and says, well, you know, you didn't translate that third line very well. <laughs> you know? but, so it goes. But did the dog have a question? <laughs> you think I'm joking? There's a really cute dog over there if you guys can't see it. Makes me miss my little guy. He's very cute too. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Nutmeg wanted me to ask it for her instead. That's uh, fair. But That's she fair. she appreciates your acknowledgement of, of her being here. Um, I appreciate her. <laughs> so, hey, professor, long time no see. Wait. Um, I'm Nick Robleski. I was in your class at USC. Yeah, I yeah. sent you an email. Um, <laughs> So yeah, great to see you again. I was, I was so excited when I, when I heard you were speaking. Um, and I guess the, the question that I wanted to ask somewhat speaks to the, the former question a little bit. Um, with like the, the work that you do, seeing something like bury my heart at wounded knee, and you see like sort of the necropolitics of native people don't exist, and uh, they stopped existing in 1890 and all that. I think it's you know pretty clear to us, to all of us in this room, and you know it was always clear in class and everything that um, you are a natural contrarian. <laughs> like you are, you know, are lighthearted and it you, shows, huh? You, <laughs> you know, uh, you're you're, but there's there's a positivity with that. Like you're, you know, you 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 show the image of 
you know, like you, you contradict the idea that, that you talked about with the stereotype of the sad Indian. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you clearly disrupt that narrative. And in, in the work to disrupt that narrative, I just, I can't imagine how like heavy on the heart that eventually gets. You know, so something I've found is just as I've been in my Master of Theological Studies in Religion, Ethics, and Politics, which is a fraction of the, you know, the kind of things that you have to deal with as, you know, writing nonfiction and addressing, mm -hmm. you know, not only historical injustices, but the existence in the present that you still have to argue for. Mm. Um, I guess, like, I don't, I'm not really sure how to ask this question. I suppose I should have thought about that, huh? <laughs> but, like, you know, like, how... Like when you're doing that work and when you're looking and when you're thinking about, you know, like these these stories that you're trying to share in a new way, you know, how do you, I guess, not just get so miserable you don't want to do it anymore? Right. <laughs> like like what 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 keeps you going? Like what, what kind of allows you to, to do that? What allows me so that's a, okay, that's a good question. So what helps me continue in the work generally that I do? Mm -hmm. um, sort of what gives me life, I guess, is a is a question. Um, it's very idiosyncratic, you know, I mean, for me, um, and so it's feel like a non sequitur, I suppose, you know, like I, I, I love on one hand, and there's a direct answer, right? Which is that, um, I am, I am deeply animated by the, the, the chance to, to like engage with all of these things in a way um, that is sort of slightly public in, the, in that sort of the books themselves are a sort of a performance of that engagement. And I, I find that immensely gratifying and invigorating. I don't find it exhausting um, at all. And, or, or, or a kind of work that sort of leaves me heavy. Um, I find it really, um, it's exhilarating. You know, so so it doesn't have a kind of deadening effect. Although I do occasionally, I'm discovering get tired, um, which I am loath to admit, honestly. Um, and I, you know, and I guess it, I'm not I'm not 20 anymore, you know. And I do get kind of fraught, you know. And the things that I do for sort of I guess what we would call self care, right? Um, in our sort of moment of both necropolitics and um, self-improvement. Right? We're always being told by society these days that you know you can be better, bigger, right? What I do is I go to um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and I try not to get choked out. <laughs> it's my it's my it's my obsession, you know. And it was the sort of this endeavor, right? Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which I don't talk about a lot because it, you know no one it's a cult and no one wants to hear about the cult. Um, but you know, you go there for an hour or two, and you're trying to submit someone. They're trying to submit you. You can't think about the past. You can't think about the future. All you can think about is not getting choked out. 